Hello, everybody, and welcome to um, How to Make a Beast with Jeff Roberts. My name is Pauline Woods Wilson from the Morris Federation, and this is one of our series of talks and workshops during lockdown. Um, we've also got uh, Katie helping Jeff today, so you should see. Oh, there she is, waves. Um, so we're going to hand over straight over to Jeff and Katie for their talk. Hello, everyone. Nice to, nice to see you all. Um, Pauline asked me asked me to do this because um, she's I'm probably the only person that she knows that's made one. Um, and it's one of these things that most people only really get to do once because there isn't a very large throughput of beasts. So, um, so I thought I'd share everything that I've done and all of the things that have gone wrong, uh, which are the important bits. And um, using just standard power tools and screwdrivers, nothing fancy really, no lathes. So um, I have this presentation and I will stop it now and then to, to show you real bits and things. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it will go into the presentation. Um, the reason that I first made one was that when I was with Woodside Morris, Morris Men, we were, um, were asked to go uh, in a town twinning thing to ben Bensheim in Germany. This was the beast that they had then, the um, dragon, which was... Um, it had this massive sort of metal frame inside it, sat on his shoulders because it was so heavy. So there was no way that we could get that onto a onto an aircraft. So I decided to make a to make a lightweight one, which is Dragon Number One, of which there are no photos. I have looked high and low, but the way I made it was to um, get this. Used to be able to get this uh, bendy plastic fencing from home base. With squares about two inches apart and what I did was bend that into a shape, secure it with cable ties and then put some plaster bandage around it um, to form the skin. I had, I've got some, um, you know these googly eyes glasses you can get from joke shops with all the springs, the springs. So I bought a pair of those, took out the eyes and used, used those, those for the eyes so they came out when it walked. Uh, and it was good, it was fine, but um, I, the rest of the side didn't like it because it was a bit weird. The, the skirt was sacking so you could see through all the way, all the way around, which I thought was good, but anyway. So for the next trip, I made this, this, this um, dragon number two. Um, and there are things that I didn't like about it afterwards. This is it in Bensheim. Um, the fact that the, it didn't really have a, have a neck meant that the, when the skirt came off, it looked a bit funny. It looked like it was coming from the jaw. Uh, and there were, there were a few things. This is, this, is, um, this is the way that I made it. So I made a plywood frame. I hinged the jaw at the bottom there. Another bad thing is that because I'd put the jaw all the way back like that, it meant that I had to have a deep slot in it for the pole to go up so that so the jaw could open. Uh, and the technique that I used for this for the skin, which is the same that I, the one, same one I've used for Giddy, which is to buy this wire mesh also from home base, I think it came. Um, which you can bend into shape and you can secure it to the plywood frame using cable, cable ties and then just put papier mache over that. I think the, um, I also, because I work for an engineering firm, um, the way that I secured the pole was I, I put a bolt, bolt through from, from the top. I don't know whether you'll be able to see it on this one. Yeah, can you see that metal bit above the pole? On there. Have you been getting that thing, Katie? Um, that was a, a, a bit of metal that I got made in, in our workshop in work. 
Yeah, uh, sorry, the um, board. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, which in cross section looks like that. So you've got the pole going in the top, and you've got the um, space for the bolt coming in the bottom there. And th that was a very, uh, very tight push, push fit for the for the pole. So you, all you had to do was twist it, twist it to get it get it out. But it's a really, really good, good fit. And the pole is just uh, a mop handle, really. Uh, the teeth at the bottom are made out of um, uh, ice ice cream cartons, so you just you get the bit where it bends at the bottom and just uh, cut cut the right shape for it. I tend to try and use any anything I can which doesn't cost money, but it doesn't all, always work. That's that. Um, this is inside the, the one that you've just seen. The, the skirt was had this um, curtain tape around the top and I held it in place using split split rings like key rings which went into the curtain tape and through the through the mesh which was a bit fiddly to get on and on and off right this is the prototype i.e the first one that failed for um, Giddy. The reason um, that I suddenly decided to make it was that um, plug time. Katie and I did this book, which we were supposed to launch at um, Whitby, but because Whitby went um, online this year, Mel asked us to make a to make a film with a reading of the book as well. So we thought, wouldn't it be a great wheeze? Well, everyone else thought, wouldn't it be a great wheeze if we had a real life giddy to go around Whitby? And this is why, why this one was made. Um, so the first iteration, got the same technique. Um, so we've got the, um, the wire mesh, which we can, you can cut using tin snips like that and then bend if you want to. Uh, but what you also need to do, you said looking for the pliers which have gone, is get some um, uh, small, ah, thank you. It's great having an assistant, isn't it? Um, I don't, I, you probably can't see it. But um, you always get these cut cut edges when you cut it. So what I do is just roll it back like that using pliers, which does take a long time, but it does save a lot of cuts. Put that down. Um, so because I knew Giddy was going to going to be a horse and he'd have quite a, quite a high forehead, I put this central central bit in. To um, to form the mesh round, um, and the same technique as the other one, you just drill lots of holes around the edge of the plywood, uh, and then um, put cable cable ties around the mesh. So all the bending and any sort of weird shapes that you want, you have to do before you put the cable cable ties in. As you can see, there, I've got all these bits of um, uh, angle brackets as well, holding that, cent that central piece on, which go into that piece of wood that you can see down the center of the workmate there. There it is again, with a big bit of mesh out the back ready to be, to be shaped. And this is what I came, this is how it ended, ended up. There it is. Still got it. It was so I got so far with it, but it was so bad that I just had to had to keep it to let to let people know. So what's what's wrong with this? Well, quite a few things. It's far too heavy. There's this big bit of wood underneath the jaw where you don't really want it because you want the jaw to be hollow up there. Um, I use this. Um, it's a dowling for the hinge 
which meant that I had to have very large piece, pieces of wood for it to go, go through. And for the, for the pole, I, I put three blocks of wood here so that when it comes in, when it comes in at, an, at an angle, that there's quite a lot of space for it so that the hole can be quite deep. But it was just far too heavy. So kick that to one side. Giddy number two. Um, I got rid of the central bit because that was that was the cause of quite a few of the problems. So and I got rid of that massive doweling rod for the hinge. So what we've got is just the frame for the top, a uh, bit of plywood for the jaw, and then two angle brackets. Oops, like this. Um, with a long screw to go into that bit of wood which is attached to the plywood. And the, um, the size of the screw is that you should be able to, not so it doesn't drop in, but you should be able to screw it through. And then when it gets to the end, it's nice and free. And you put a washer on that side and a washer on that side to protect the wood. And it's, it's quite an easy hinge then. Absolutely brilliant. I don't know who thought of that. Oh, it's me. Anyway, um, so that's a, that was a, that was a new frame, and as a basis, it was great. And you might notice that the jaw was actually cut smaller than the uh, top bit. So I had to put some uh, add some padding padding bits in so that the when the when the when the angle bracket comes down, it's vertical. Um, the way that I cut the um, plywood, plywood out was to just make some paper, uh, cardboard stencils. And if you want it symmetric, you make half the cardboard sten stencil and then, and then flip it. So that's a new frame. That's the, those are the padding bits that I had to, had to add because I made that mistake at the start. And teeth, oh. Um, when you cut things in funny shapes out of plywood, you end up with lots of scrap plywood left. So what I did was um, clamped it to the uh, workbench and got a jigsaw and just made loads and loads of cuts like that. There's, there's actually a pencil line, I don't know whether you can see it. So you just go in from the edge up to that pen, 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 pencil line and get lo loads and loads of teeth. These are some spare ones that I had. So these are my spare teeth. Uh, the lower jaw is being, um, they're being glued in place just by using wood glue. But of course it has to be, has to be clamped to make it a good, good fit. Flashing out the head. So because we have, because we don't have that central thing now, we need to try and give it um, body so that the when the mesh is put over, it doesn't just collapse when you're sort of pushing it and things. So the nose is a cut out of a four pint milk carton, and um, which just happened to be the right shape for the front. And uh, later, later, later on, you'll see that I've just punched through that and put some cable ties around there to keep it keep it on. Um, I also, Matt Davis had just done some work on the house and had loads of this King's, Kingspan four inch insulation, um, which I thought would be great to carve. And so it, it's quite it's quite easy to um, carve. Uh, with some scissors, just get bits off. You use a use a kitchen knife or anything, and it will. Um, it's quite good. And the good thing about this is that when we come to do the eyes, we can fix them in place by putting a cocktail stick into this and then sticking the arm the arm top, which I'll show show you later.
Uh, right, this is, so this is the um, crudely shaped king span, um, the milk bottle at the front. You'll notice on this one, I learned my lesson from, from Dragon 2 and I moved the jaw forward, forward a bit. So you can see the slot inside the jaw doesn't have to go all the way, all the way down like it did with the other one. Um, and for some reason, I don't know why, after I got to this stage and carved, carved a bit of the head, I made a video. Um, my eyeballs. I uh, gritted my teeth and um, actually bought some bought something special for this. Um, these are from a hobby hobby craft, I think. You can get these polystyrene balls. And God knows what the people use them for. Um, but if you put a cocktail stick in there and then stick that into that king king span. You can position them, and then you can find out where you need to carve out the eye, the eye sockets, which is what this photo is showing, showing here. So you don't want, obviously you don't want the balls sticking right out on the top. Um, so carve some eye sockets so that you can position them right. Now Pauline said she didn't think these were positioned right, but I think they're fairly symmetric. If anyone agrees with Pauline, don't bother contacting me. <laughs> this is the skin again. The mesh is held is um, shaped by the the stuff that we've got on there. Cable ties going through the through the holes and through the through the mesh. This is um, the upper set of teeth, which I decided to do as a a special, so that this screws into the piece of pl the main piece of ply plywood at the top. So you can see it's just, you can see how it's made, exactly how I, how I said er earlier. And um, again, this is being stuck on there using wood, wood glue and clamps. Uh, the support, um, obviously I'm retired. I don't have access to my engineering firm anymore. So I had to come up with something else. And fortunately in the yard, I had, I had some fence posts, which I thought would be great to put in a, a stick. So what you do is you drill a hole for this. If anything, drill it smaller than the stick uh, using, well, sorry. You do, you do a, you do a um, pilot hole using a long, narrow drill. Then you get your uh, large hole drill and um, cut, a lot, cut a hole which is slightly smaller. I think, I don't know this. That's very slightly smaller than the uh, pole. Now, if it's, uh, if it's such a good hole that the pole won't go in because you've done it dead straight, which I don't do, then you, you, you can always cut some slots in the end of the pole and just squeeze it, squeeze it in. What I do is, um, because I don't have any lathe or anything, when I'm drilling my hole, my hand waggles around a lot, which is perfect for the effect that I wanted, which is a put push fit. Into the, into the hole. So what you need to do, you get your fence post. Um, you do the small drill first to make your pilot hole. You use the big drill to get the hole deep for the pole. And we don't hardly ever want a beast which, whose head is at right angles to the pole. So 
what you do is you cut a plane at the angle that you want and then screw the fence post onto the, the main bit of plywood using four screws, making sure they don't go too near the end or, el or else they'll come out. Um, and it doesn't matter if this pointy bit at the end goes over the edge of the plywood because it's not really doing, doing much. What are we doing for time? Halfway, that's good. And there it is. There's my bit of bit of wood. Um, marked in it, made the hole. It goes in. It's screwed to the the main bit of plywood there. This is the jaw which has been uh, papier mâché in here, and this is the bit of metal that you screw to the jaw so you can pull it open and and, and close. And this is the bit of string to do that here. Uh, the papier mache bit, bog standard paste, the cheapest wallpaper paste that I could find, um, pieces of the cheapest newspaper that I could find that gave me a lot of bulk, the, some of the Chew Valley Gazette from KT, the, the parent sender, and uh, a few a, a few weekend guardians. Um, so you can see I puppy mache. I don't want to puppy mache the eye, the, eye, the eye sockets though, because what I want to do is, once the eyes are in there, bring the puppy mache over over it to as an extra bit of security. There it is, puppy mache. Now, when when I try to put this on. We found out that it was a bit too big to get your head and shoulders in. So we cut it short. And just to prove we cut it short, there's a bit that came off. Which has got some nasty edges. So um better watch that. Um, so I ended up like this. Um, I'll talk about these in a uh, second. I, I did start to um try and paint this in white acrylic, but it didn't cover very well. So uh, I think someone suggested putting white A4 paper on it and then putting extra coat of paint paint on, on that, which I, which I did, which was a lot easier. I wasted a lot of time trying to trying to cover, cover that. Uh, ears. Right. Uh, This is the way that they're, that they're made. You get some of this um, thin foam sheets, also from a craft shop. I hated buying it because I wanted two sheets and I had to buy about 25 or 50. And there's colours that I will never use. Anyway, so what you do is you fold it into a, an eerie shape. Let's see, anyone, anyone who's done Robert Harbin's origami will know how. Like that, then you can uh, staple that to keep it in place. Staple that to keep it in place, and then put another cable tie through, uh, and then just trim off all the excess. And that's uh, that's what we see. What what the picture is showing is the folded bottom of the ear. Uh, so there's a cable tie through the ear and there's a cable tie through that cable tie and into the into the mesh. Um, if you want the ears to stand up, which, uh, which isn't necessarily a good idea, is it poorly? No? Good. <laughs> um, you can secure that with, with a couple of cable, cable ties instead. But I only, I only use, use one. We thought it would be a great weed because because in the book Giddy's eyes are moving all over the place. We thought it would be a great weed to have remove uh, movable pu pupils. 
So this is a prototype here. Basically, cut out bits of bits of white Velcro, stick them onto your poly polystyrene ball, get a bit of black Velcro, and then you just move it around wherever you want to. Um, and the mouth. The good thing about getting a multicolored set of thin foam craft stuff is that there was a red one in there that I could use for the tongue, which is just it's just glued glued to the back of the back of the jaw. Uh, there's another bit here where I painted uh, an, ep an epiglottis and throat. That's about all, really. Here's the head. So we've got the ears, uh, the eyes, and everything else. The reason that um, I don't like stiff ears, you can see they, that they actually started off being uh, upright here. The reason that I don't like them is because if you're going to put this into a bag or on the floor or anything like that, they will break off or get, or get squashed. So as, this, as soon, the first time I put this onto the floor, head, ear, ears down, they just bent over and I just left them. The skirt. This is Giddy with his gormous expression. He's got a mane, he's got the skirt. Right, made out of several panels because unfortunately when I drew Giddy, I put multicolored panels on. Um, so we have the mesh here that you can look through and I'd, have, I'd probably use something like um, a nylon curtain mesh if I could, but I was short of time and I had some of this, um, I don't need that plastic stuff now. Yeah, I had, you know, the, um, the stuff that's supposed to stop things moving, non-stick stuff, when you when you put things down. I had some of that which was which had quite large hole, holes in. So I used I used that and it was black unfortunately. So when I painted it, you can't really see the there, there is red and green paint on there, but you can't really see it. Um, pitfalls. It has to flare out quickly. From the uh, from the neck, because you're holding the pole, and the first thing it's going to hit is your shoulders. So if you can't fit your shoulders in the first six inches, it won't work. And uh, choose the bottom, choose the bottom of the skirt wide enough so that you can run in it or dancing it and not trip up. There it is. Um, Right, Giddy has st sticky back Velcro on the inside of the neck, which is how this sticks. Should we put it on there? Okay. We'll, we're going to put it, put it on there. Okay, sorry. Yeah, do that later. There's Giddy. Okay, so there's the skirt. Have you, have you got the pole? Put the, uh, put the pole under it. Is it in? Yep. It's in. All right, so. That's it, yeah. Go on. Okay, so uh, thank you, Giddy. Um, and there's this. Um, you don't. We didn't need this, but because stupidly, I put it in the drawing again. We had to make some pennants for the outside. Cunningly, 
there is a hole in the middle one so that Katie can actually see out. And again, it's sticky back val Valfro. Just stay there for a minute, Katie. Uh, I'm, I'm going to share the screen again. That's the panel. Ah, oh, Katie, do you want to get out of there? Talk about okay, me. so about me. Uh, I made the mane by um, measuring the length from the top of his head to the bottom of the neck and just doing a lot of wool plaited together to make like a thick spine of wool and then just um, making lots and lots of fringes coming off of it by just folding pieces of wool in half and looping them through the loops in the plait. So just a, an evening in front of the telly, just making endless loops of wool. Um, and I made a pom-pom to go on the top for his, for his um, forelock. So. Okay. I also have to acknowledge that the person that made the skirt was Matt da Davis, because I don't have a sewing machine and I can't sew. There's Giddy, you've just seen panting around the room. And that's it. Questions then. Can if people want to put them in the chat, that'll be fab. Or um, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, I'm sure Jeff won't mind. Yeah, fine. Were you basing that on one you'd already seen? Were you basing your horse on one you had seen or? No, I was basing it on one that I'd drawn. It's in the it's in the book. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know that. And unfortunately, I had to make it to look like that. Otherwise, it might have turned out completely different. I, I, was, you, I probably would have made it easier. You talked about having it at an angle, and that oh, yeah. was interesting. I had never thought about that, but it makes it easier. So. Um, oh yeah, uh, well, because. Certainly, whole, well, most things are. Most most things' heads come down like that, don't they? Uh, so it doesn't seem right to have things. God, what a, what a great crocodile it is! Uh, <laughs> doesn't um, doesn't seem right to have things like that, does it? I, I was because because then because they're usually taller than the person hold, holding them as well. So then it's looking down down at them. Mm -hmm. I often use the. Put the top of my head underneath it so it supports the wood. It supports oh. the head, supports the weight. But, uh, but mine are all flat. <laughs> uh, I had uh, not thought of that. <laughs> right. So, question in the chat, Jeff. Um, I would. Uh, or how heavy is the head? I sh I knew I should. I was going to bring my bathroom scales down actually to weigh it. But it's fairly light. I would say though it's a little bit heavy for if you're wearing it all day, like the day that we made the film, I think Jeff and Richard, who were taking it in turns to play Giddy, were starting to find it a little bit he heavy, having it on a lot of the time. Um, and we did talk about maybe having one of those things that you carry a flag with, like the like scouts oh, yeah. carry a flag? No, I don't. You, you don't need that. I don't might. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine as far as I'm concerned anyway. I'll carry it all day. <laughs> Mary Lloyd, I would love to have experience with real schools, but horse schools aren't all that easy to come by, are they? Um, I, I mean, Mary Louise is just fantastic. They, they're, they, they're so... Um, menacing in a way that Giddy isn't. But then Giddy's from a from a children's book, so I'm, I hope he isn't menacing. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Would you be able to use, rather than using wood, which is obviously heavy, yeah. would you be able to create a frame for his jaw and his his nose part out of, you know, substitute the wood for some sort of, um, I don't know, mesh, uh, wire mesh wrapped in newspaper like you've done with the rest? Um, yeah, the reason for using the wood is that it provides a rigid frame. I mean, there is 
even the jaw, there is mesh around the, around the jaw, mm. um, but yeah, mesh, mesh will bend. And all, although once you put about four or five layers of papier-mâché on it, it's quite stiff. Um, I wouldn't like to have anything bendy because as soon as you put that down on the floor or someone kicks it in the Morris side, mm. uh, it will just bend and break. So, so if you were to create it out of mesh and then put like rulers shapes to sort of like scaffolding around it to hold right. the shape. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So you something have... just lighter, really, because yeah, that's where yeah. the weight lies, isn't it? In that, in that jaw, I should think. Um, yeah, the weight lies in all the bits of wood, mm. but the heaviest bit of wood is probably the the big the big fence post that the, that the pole yeah. goes in. Yeah. Um, but you could do that. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought of that. That I, I went for the easy, simple way. Um, <laughs> but you ended up the, with yeah, <laughs> the, a ton weight. <laughs> yes, yeah, at the expense yeah. of weight. Yeah. Yes, I'm thinking. Do you know um, when they had crinolines? They would oh, have yeah. um, linen, and then there would be hula hoop things to hold the skirt out. Yeah. On that principle. Yeah. Strangely enough, I was going to put um, a plastic hula hoop at the at the bottom of the skirt to hold it. To hold make it. it yeah. yeah. But that would be quite awkward because every time you put it down, there'd be this massive kind of hoop of material sticking up and getting in people's way and getting kicked. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the good thing about this, we were carrying it around with me in this bag because it, mm. it just mm. goes in the bag head down mm. and, they, and they, um, the skirt folds inside the head. So it's quite yeah. easy. Yeah, light enough. It's the, it's just the, the weight of the head, isn't it? Because after and if it's hot, you're you know you're getting tired and hot. Yeah. If it's a hot day. I don't. Kind of, yeah, I think you're right. I, um, but I don't think the perfect Morris beast exists, really, does it? I've no idea. <laughs> I just like I like making things. Really like yeah. making. Things. Mm. And that's I, I'm I might do that, and I might have some holes coming out to keep the, keep it a bit cooler. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah, ventilation yeah. holes. <laughs> yeah, or, or kind of little portholes in it to just get a draft through the thing. I don't know. I, I've not worn a beast. I've never danced in one, but I love them. Yeah. Um, next one. How is the weight taken on the shoulders? And no, it's no, it isn't it? You you just carry carry the pole, and. Um... Shove it without the skirt. Just... Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the um, the Woodside Dragon had that massive heavy frame which had shoulder shoulder pads on, um, but this one is just you just hold it using using the pole. What it, I, I I guess the trick is to keep it fairly well balanced so that you're not always trying to you know isn't always pulling you back or forward. Mm. Um, uh, and the mesh and puppet, no, the um, Sue E. Um, there's a plywood frame, and the, the pole is uh, virtually attached to that plywood frame, and the mesh and papier mache sit on that frame. Mm -hmm. They are way down the bottom of the skirt. Fortunately, it was okay. Didn't have to really. Uh, it, um, the, the material's heavy enough not to, not to have to do that. And also, weights might get in the way if you're, um, if you're dancing around the this, around this set, I suppose. Look at straw bear. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, have to look. But straw bear's much heavier, isn't it? So. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, I have... One comment is that a friend of mine made a Maori Lewitt, a beautiful one. She bought the skull off the internet. Apparently oh, really? My <laughs> horse's skull. She had no problem getting it. Of course. I don't know whether that's in the States or what, but, yeah. you know, it was not a problem. Um, the other thing was that when I made all of mine, most of mine are on a pole, as you said, 
-hmm. But then uh, this young kid that's been making some for a show we're in, okay. we, we together we came up with putting in a frame underneath. We thought that was brilliant, and you went the other direction. But well, we just used tomato cages. Yeah, you know, the reason it, is you, know, you, you, can, yeah, yeah, you, you can you can carry a much heavier weight like that, and it's and it's probably a bit more com comfy as well. But because you can carry a heavier weight, people tend to make their heads heavy. So you can't actually do a lot of movement. You, you, yeah, you my heads are all too heavy, really. Yeah. My heads are all really too heavy. The the kid that worked with me, he made paper mache ones, so his were lighter anyway. If I was doing it again, I would. I I didn't realise just how cheap this plaster plaster bandage is. Mm -hmm. uh, if I was doing it again, I would probably use that because it would cut the time to make the skin in. Well, it must be a factor of four or five. Yeah. That was great, that wire with the stuff, aren't I? I really right. like that. Any more questions? Oh, but Marie Louise don't tend to have shells rest, do they? No, they don't. But they're heavy. <laughs> Shirley. Jeff, you're obviously an expert now um, and you like a challenge, so when are you going to make a giant penguin? I knew you were going. To, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I would have asked that if you hadn't, Shirley. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Good. Good. For those that don't know, Jeff is in a team called Rock Hopper, and their logo is a penguin. So that's why Shirley's asking. Yes, Shirley's a curator of the large fluffy one, aren't you? The what? Oh. Are you? Oh, yeah. Oh. Hang on. Oh, I wish I had a shared screen. I can't see Shirley. Hello, Shirley. There's, there's yeah. a model for you to base it on. Mm. It's I'll, dressed I'll... in White and Morris Men's kit. <laughs> Long story, but that's, you could base it on that. Yeah, no problem. When do when, when you want it by? Well, when, when we can ever dance out again, Jeff. <laughs> You know this is being recorded, don't you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> In that case, let, let me just add something. <laughs> <laughs> About money. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Oh. Hello? Okay, can I ask, um, if anybody else is bursting this butt in, um, if you were to quantify how much it would cost, sort of looking at your time, Probably materials, probably fairly small, but time probably quite big. Um, if anybody wanted to actually buy one or, you know, try to work out how much it was going to cost, have you any idea? There's a rarity value, of course, as well. No, I, I have no idea, but I would think if you were doing it commercially, you'd probably charge about 150 to 200 quid because it yeah. takes a lot of time. Yeah. Although if you, if, you, if you went the plaster bandage route, that might cut that by half. Frank was, I think, trying to ask a question. Oh, it, was, it, it wasn't a question, if you forgive my anecdote, and you've heard this before, Jeff, but it just uh, illustrates how effective horses are. Uh, uh, I saw one in Newcastle, and it was a proper horse's skull, and it looked quite menacing. And the uh, and, and the horse chased some little boy into a shop doorway, and the, and the boy burst into tears. <laughs> and the parent then remonstrated with the horse, and uh, the bloke inside the horse said, uh, I'm the same height as you, by the way. I'm down here behind this gauze if you want to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> when we took it, when we took it to it, to it, to it, to it one of our um, filming bits was going inside the station inn. So I was outside sort of munching at the um, hanging baskets of the house. And this bloke walks past, uh, I knew it was bound to happen. This bloke walks past and says, why the long face? <laughs> I have a question. I wouldn't what? mind, but we put that line in our, in our book as well. <laughs> Sorry, I miss someone. Before or after? <laughs> Uh, before. I miss that. Someone was trying to ask a question. Oh. Yeah. What are there any um, 
old examples of beasts and do they vary a lot or are um, is was there a sort of a an old standard how do older beasts compare with more modern beasts with modern materials i don't know the i think the earliest ones that i've seen photos of is early 20th century sort of 20, 1920s or something i'm not sure i'm not i make them but I'm not really sure about the history of them, I have to say. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyone, anyone else know? I first saw them at the Hobby Horse Festival in, um, yes, wherever the Hobby Horse Festival is. <laughs> and uh, there are some ancient ones. And my first one, I mean, I'd seen, pick, I'd seen these beasts at this festival and I came home and tried to recreate them, but they were old, they were old. Uh, you know, a couple of hundred years old or more. Some of them were, and they were hood. Wow. They were called hooden horses, and oh, they yeah. think they were associated with not necessarily Morris, but various uh, play, you know, plays like Mama's plays and what have you. But there are, there is some history, and there are some for the Hobby Horse Festival. They take some out of museums that are really old and bring them. For yeah, like hooden, hooden horses are from Kent, aren't they? Right. Yeah. Uh, I, and there was, I did read somewhere that. Uh, a side in Kent had one, and it ended up in the northeast somewhere near me, but mm -hmm. no idea where. Yeah. Uh, Kathy Parkinson has a question. Has a hand raised. Hi. Hi, Jeff. Yeah. Hello. When you make the penguin for rock popper, <laughs> would, you, yeah. would you would you please be able to make it so that we can collect money through the beak, or is that too difficult? No. The um, Second dragon that I made for Woodside had that. That was a, uh, a requirement for it. So, uh, so what you do is you um, you sort of pin a pin a bag around the jaw. So people put money in the jaw, then you drop in the bag. Yeah. Brilliant. That'd be yeah. fine. Thank you. We'll put make one. Yeah. Yeah. Surely there'd be a danger of collecting rotten fish as well. Oh. Yeah. Regurgitated yeah. fish. <laughs> Penguins don't have jaws. You should you should make a um, what's the big fish that eat, has a pouch the pelican instead of a penguin <laughs> you'd get a lot more money. Right, uh, there's a, there's a question to Katie. It's me that's from the Chew Valley. I'm I'm from Bishop Sutton. Where where are you from, person looking at Chew Valley Lake? Sue E. He's on mute. You're muted. I'm here. Yeah, we live in Bishop Sutton too. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> it's a small world. For Sarah Maguire, but find us down at the library on a Saturday. Uh, I'm currently in Amble in Northumberland, so I'm just uh, from Bishop Sutton. I get the Two Valley Gazette posted from my parents. Who's uh, Bishop um, the name of the book is Giddy Up at Whitby. Other, other giddy merchandise is available yeah thank you Sarah for giving me yet another chance to plug the book <laughs> and what age range is the book aimed at Jeff I think we said so well reading it themselves um, I think primary, probably primary school age children would enjoy reading it themselves but um, it's being read to much younger children. So my my daughter, who's 18 months old, really enjoys it. And we've had a couple of other people buy it, who one or two year olds who enjoy having it read to them and enjoy poking giddy in the pictures. So. Hello. It occurs to me, would would it be possible to make little dummy, what little small ones for children to play with, like little puppets? Like hand puppets, do you know? My children used to love hand puppets. Rupert Bear and lions and things like that. I think it'd be well, quite cute. It would, but not using the method that I've described here. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> not using skills. Going to sleep at night wouldn't be lovely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, somebody's asked about where they can buy the book. I'll... Um, I'll send the information in that. I'll send an email around after 
after this, probably tomorrow or Monday, and I'll put information there about how to get the book, but you're basically contacting um, Jeff or Katie. I just want to say thank you. It was very helpful. It gave me a lot of ideas that I hadn't thought of. You know, well, had... mainly, mainly from the mistakes I've made, I think. Well, well, yeah, we all learn that way. I think yeah. if we don't know what we're doing, we learn that way. Well, if we've got no more questions, then Ginny has promised to show us a little tour of the beast well, she's got behind one... her. You were talking of strange things. This one I made for an ale that was set where... Um, uh, Lovecraft made a lot of his strange things. So this was originally, I don't think you can see it. It was originally Cthulhu. It has many oh, arms yeah. and it's very <laughs> large. Wow. And uh, he, he lost his wings when he was used in a stage thing for an octopus or a kraken. But... <laughs> this is my original one that I, that I took from the... Um, the ones at uh, you know, the ears, the ear problem you talked about, Jeff, yeah. Um, oh, yes, yeah. This is my original one that I copied more or less from something I saw at the Hobby Horse Festival. And it was fabulous fun because I went to a hardware store and found uh, pieces of hardware that made pretty colors, you know, and I used the studs, the furniture studs and corner pieces and... But, Somebody borrowed this one and lost an ear recently. And this one I just recently put on a tomato frame. It used to be on a stick. If you haven't found this cloth, I don't remember what it's called, but it's completely see-through from one side, but you can't see through the other side. So you don't need a panel in it. So I've been switching. This used to have a skirt with a panel. Now it has this stuff. And you're inside. You can't be seen, but you can see out. It's great stuff. But I made six of them for a uh, Molly team that was in a play. And there were six different animals. So I made the horse and the sheep and a fox. Can you see that large fox there? <laughs> Oh, I should stand up, I guess. Huh? Uh, that, this one. I can't get them out. He's a, I don't know whether you can see that one. Yeah. I use a, diff, a different method for each one of them, just for the fun of it. He's got like the floral things that you use for your eyeballs. That's what his, that's what his nose is. And he's on a, I, uh, one by two, I think it was the wood. Um, oh, that's a, uh, it was an English badger, which no Americans knew what it was. They kept saying that doesn't look like a badger because the American badger is a different animal. <laughs> He's incredibly heavy, way too heavy. Oh, my favorite. He's a hedgehog, or he's meant to be a hedgehog. <laughs> and he was just had an antique broom that I just cut a yard broom. I cut in half and played around with it. <laughs> oh, there used to be a huge stag, but he was so breakable, he just kept shedding bits, and he's rather a <laughs> not very good looking stag now. I've never seen anyone with a hobby horse hobby before. Yeah, I have. It's a bad hobby. <laughs> this one is one that gets used a lot by one of the kids who hangs around with our Morris team because it's so light. It's on a frame. It's on a frame like yours, but the, you know, wire. Yeah. Chicken wire frame. It's a rooster. But yeah, my house is filled with them. It's a very small house and it's very crowded. <laughs> so... They're all, it was fun. Everything's different. And I just play around like, like Jeff does to, to make them and just see what oh, I've got in the basement or go to the... The first, oh. the first, the first dragon I made, which had the, just the sucking as the skirt. Yeah. That was, 
similar. It was very hard to see into it, but you can see out. You can see all the way, all the way around. It's really right. Really good. Um, but one thing that 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 I stress was when I'm making mine, I want to make it light enough so that people can dance around the set with it. Mm -hmm. And if it isn't that light, it's just going to walk around, not really doing much. Right. This. Uh... Well, we did actually we wrote a dance for the for the for the six beasts that I started with. We did write a dance. They performed a dance in a play, mm. um, but we had some big guys on that team because they are heavy, and and that's what I was really interested in your lightness and stuff. That makes a, oh, yeah. a big difference. I and this guy, yeah. this guy is ridiculously too large to use for anything. You know, it was. <laughs> It was a gag thing, you know, and his eyeballs, by the way, I think are soap dishes. That's right. That's what his eyeballs are. They, you know, you find, as you said, you find what you have around. Most of these things are not expensive. They're just... Yeah, my, my, the first eyeballs are, as I said, the um, googly eyes from Glasses. Yeah, that's a great idea, especially if you left the springs, yeah. if they can... The second one is just ping pong balls that I... Um, uh, papier mache in, and the third ones are these expensive ones. Well, <laughs> expensive as far as I'm concerned. I, I right. Know. Most of these have just got eyeballs painted on. Mm. You can't even see it I in think, this distance. I think my next it. one, which may or may not be a penguin, I'm going to try and get the eyes to move. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a, a good way, isn't it? If you go and look on a, a puppet page, they tell you how to move the eyeballs. You can oh, look at yeah. how to make a, a puppet that moves. Well, thank you, Ginny. That was fascinating. And uh, <laughs> I love the hedgehog. That was my favourite. Yeah, he's my favourite too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's four o'clock. So um, I'd, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Jeff and Katie mm -hmm. and uh, Ginny, who wasn't expecting to present today. But if, you, <laughs> if you'd like to unmute and give them a round of applause. That'd be lovely. <laughs> and I shall look forward to seeing the penguin at some point.